survivor space and today's survivor circle session. Um, we're very happy that you've joined us today. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome the CEO of Zero Abuse Project, uh, Jeff Dion, as our presenter today. Before we get started, I just wanted to um, go over a couple of logistics for folks who may not have joined a Survivor Circle session before. Um, so on the page here, hopefully what you're watching right now, um, our live stream on the page is in the, the little box under the label live stream. If you would like to see it larger on your screen, you can click on the small square icon in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. It's being live streamed on Zero Abuse Project's YouTube page, so you can also watch it directly on YouTube. If you would like to ask a question of Jeff or to comment on anything that he talks about today, please type directly into the chat box on this uh, Survivor Circle page, and we will do our best to, to get those questions to Jeff and to, to answer them for you. So uh, without further ado, I will gladly turn it over to Jeff. Thank you all so much for being here. Great. Thanks, Becky, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, this is a survivor circle, and our uh, topic is about reconciling my scouting sexual abuse. And I, I really hope that this can be much more of a conversation than a uh, presentation. So I hope it'll be interactive. I hope people will offer comments uh, and questions, um, uh, because otherwise I'm probably going to run out of things to say, and then I'll just start singing campfire songs or something. Um, but I wanted to start off with just some background. Um, about my scouting experience. And uh, I'm 56 years old now, and I was a little late to scouting. Uh, when I was in elementary school, and I always saw the kids coming to school in their Cub Scout or Weeblo uniforms uh, on the day they would have their meetings, I was interested and I thought, you know, could I join scouting? And my parents said no and had some excuse. Um, and then when I was in middle school, you know, most kids, if they start in Cub Scouts, uh, they bridge over to scouting uh, at the end of the fifth grade or when they're 10 and a half. Um, and, uh, but I didn't join scouting until I was in the seventh grade. So I was a couple years uh, behind uh, people my age. And it was uh, the way it often happens. My best friend from school said, hey, why don't you come with me uh, to a troop meeting? And so I went with my friend David to a troop meeting and then went to another. And before you know it, uh, I was part of the troop uh, and uh, starting off earning skill awards, going camping, uh, things like that. And I really enjoyed scouting and looking back i still think it was a really uh, a very positive experience and i think those skills uh the leadership skills the outdoor skills um uh all of those things are really important and and great benefits of scouting and i had a lot of fun too um in uh so in the fall of 1982, um, I was elected by my troop um, into the Order of the Arrow uh, and went through my ordeal. Uh, and I was very interested in being involved in the Order of the Arrow and the things I'd heard about it from friends and stuff. And one of my first opportunities after my uh, ordeal to attend something was a, a section conference. Uh, and it was several hours away. I grew up in South Florida. Um, and this section conference was uh, up in Gainesville in the northern central part of the state. And nobody else from my troop was going. Uh, but that didn't matter because you could just go and sign up to be on the council bus. And so I checked out a tent and camping equipment um, out of uh, from my troop and off I went. Uh, and looking back, I'm like, wow, I mean, I wasn't. There wasn't any adult that was assigned to me, um, you know, even when you go to. Uh, camp or other 
activities on a provisional basis. Uh, like when I worked at summer camp, kids could go, uh, if they, if their troop wasn't going, they could go provisional. They'd put them all together and have them function as a troop, um, uh, during that week. And they had a leader. Um, I went to Philmont as a scout, as part of a, uh, provisional group of maybe 30 kids or so from our council. And, but we had adults and they were assigned to us. Um, and, but this for order the arrow it really lacked that sort of structure uh, especially because i was new um uh, i was very involved in order the arrow in my later years i was a chapter chief i ran for lodge chief um and i came to know adults through order the arrow and develop some great relationships some of those relationships continue even today um, and so while later, uh, you know, there were adults that I knew and that I was hanging out with and were looking out for me on, on uh, order the arrow events in subsequent years, when I was a relatively new kid, uh, I didn't have that. And, uh, so we took the bus up and the fact that I was going by myself, um, I was 15 years old, nobody else from the troop was going, but I was getting on a bus with a bunch of other scouts and adult leaders from South Florida and going to this section conference, um, made me feel really grown up, uh, like this was a big deal. And, uh, so I went, set up, uh, my tent and everything was great. Um, and then on that Friday night, uh, there was just a torrential rainstorm, uh, and my tent flooded. Uh, which was a first, and my sleeping bag was soaked, and I ultimately made the decision that I was going to um, abandon the tent. Uh, there was a shelter uh, nearby that I could see, and it had a light on, and so I got out of my tent and went over there, and there were some other kids who had been washed out of their tents, too, that were sitting under there, um, and we just sort of sat there and waited uh, for the sun to come up and so that we could dry things out. Uh, and when I did and was talking to other people, um, mentioned to uh, one adult that my sleeping bag opened and he's like, oh, well, I have an extra and you can stay in my tent. Um, and that was in uh, retrospect, a real uh, opportunistic move for him uh, to, uh, abuse me. And, uh, I hadn't really met this leader before, but I, I had seen him on my ordeal. Uh, and I don't care if I'm giving away secrets, but, uh, you know, when you go through your ordeal, there's a period of like 24 hours where you don't talk. Um, and this adult, uh, was going through his ordeal. Um, but he was doing a service project and he was not going to be bothered with not talking. And I remember thinking that guy's kind of gruff and he's not following the rules. Like there's a way we're supposed to do this. Um, but that was the adult, you know, uh, the following spring who, uh, had, uh, taken me in and, um, and abused me. And I don't think that I thought too much about it at the time. Um, and I don't think that I, um, for years, really thought much about it. I had been, uh, I was a survivor. I had been sexually abused when I was seven, uh, repeatedly. And I re always felt that that had uh, more of an impact. And, and, as I grew up and went to college and became a lawyer and knew that I wanted to do work uh, with crime victims, and I joined uh, the National Center for Victims of Crime and was working there and was traveling to crime victim conferences. And, uh, and so in through my work, I really became more familiar and acquainted with some of the dynamics uh, of abuse and what survivors go through as they recover. And one of the things that I came to realize is 
that when abuse has an older team, it's not unusual for them to minimize it um, because it is easier for them to feel responsible. Um, uh, being abused when I was seven, I thought, you know, when you're seven, everyone is bigger than you. And so that's okay. It's sort of forgivable. But when you're abused at 15, you th think, well, this isn't helpless. Nobody put a gun to my head. Um, and so you there, I think sometimes there's more shame associated uh, with that. And, you know, why didn't, why didn't I do something differently? Um, and so I think for a long time, I really didn't focus on or think much about that experience or its impact. Um, the, uh, this leader was really very manipulative and, um, I actually saw him again, um, maybe two weeks after that camp out and he drove to my house and, uh, picked me up under some false pretenses and I was just sort of duped. Um, but then I never saw him again. Um, and it wasn't until years later that I learned, uh, that not long after that, he was, uh, uh, criminally prosecuted for, uh, abusing boys in his troop. Um, so, uh, that's when, uh, and as I went through this, uh, as an adult and started to reflect on it, uh, and came to realize some of the things that, that did have an impact on me. Um, and that, uh, you know, there were some physical characteristics of him. He had this bushy beard, um, uh, and was a really hairy guy. And, um, I've realized that as an adult, and I think this is left over from that, I sort of have, um, an aversion, uh, to people who have some of those same, uh, characteristics like big beards and stuff. Um, but, uh. I've had the benefit of looking, of living through that, and then uh, sort of seeing things from the other side. Um, because uh, my work at the National Center for Victims of Crime uh, had to do with civil remedies for crime victims. Uh, and I ran a bar association of lawyers uh, who represent crime victims in civil lawsuits. Uh, and you could sue the perpetrator of that crime, or you could sue an organization that was negligent, that failed to protect someone, sort of like suing the Catholic Church for clergy sex abuse. And so I dealt a lot with these cases. I worked with lawyers um, who handled these cases, who represented survivors, um, and became very familiar uh, with uh, a lot of that litigation and the issues that they faced. Um, it was, uh, through the work of some of those lawyers, uh, uh, that brought suit against the Boy Scouts out in Oregon, uh, that we learned of the ineligible volunteer files. And those were the secret files that uh, the Boy Scouts kept. If someone was kicked out, if an adult was kicked out of Scouts for um, uh, improper conduct or uh, was ruled ineligible to be a volunteer, uh, that it would be in these files. So they knew who these people were. And that's what came out through the litigation was how much they knew um, and, but really how much they also kept secret about what they knew. Um, and through that litigation, ultimately large parts of the ineligible volunteer file, uh, was publicly released and it's been scanned and you can, it's available, um, you know, parts of it are available online. And I actually was able to, uh, look up and find, um, the file on my own abuser, uh, and then sort of put the pieces together about uh, what was happening and how he was 
being criminally prosecuted and uh, being kicked out of scouts. Uh, and nobody ever knew about me. Um, and I certainly wasn't going to tell anyone. Uh, by the time I learned that this had happened, I was uh, out of scouts and in college. Um, and I don't know, I don't know if I would have come forward. I don't know what I would have said if I was asked. Um, it's not uncommon when um, law enforcement has information uh, about uh, adolescents or teens that they uh, think were sexually abused and talk to them about it, that they will deny it. It is not uncommon uh, for survivors to deny it to family, to friends, even to law enforcement um, at first, because it is an instinctual reaction uh, because it's a secret that uh, you want to keep. And uh, so that was uh, that was an interesting perspective I had to look back and understand what was going on uh, and because I had lived both sides of it. Uh, now, one of the things that keeps so many survivors from coming forward once they realize um, what they've experienced, that it counts as abuse. Um, and maybe once they recognize how they were harmed by this um, is the statute of limitations. Uh, and the statute of limitations is like a legal stopwatch uh, and that uh, dictates how long someone has to file a civil lawsuit. Um, but with the statute of limitations, the issue is always when does the clock start ticking? Uh, when does the clock stop ticking? And is there anything that can pause the clock? Um, so generally, the clock starts ticking when the abuse occurs. Um, but then it's paused until someone becomes an adult, at least until they reach the age of 18. <clears throat> In some places, uh, and it varies from state to state, the clock might be paused until the survivor discovers uh, that they were harmed by the abuse. Um, and But once that statute of limitations is run, that was the end of the opportunity. And most of the time when I was working in this field, having been uh, uh, abused in Florida, Florida had a very short statute of limitations. Um, and so I was way beyond the statute of limitations and uh, did not have an opportunity uh, to file a, uh, a civil suit. And in some ways, it really makes no sense that you're expecting people to be uh, to file a suit before many of them even know that they were harmed by this. Um, I was in law school, so I was probably in my uh, mid to late 20s before I recognized that all of the, the different things that happened to me growing up, that they counted, that that constituted abuse. Um, but it was not until my early 30s that I really recognized how I had been harmed uh, by that. Uh, but it's likely uh, that my statute of limitation in uh, Florida to file a civil suit would have run probably around the time I was uh, 20 years old. Um, and so it was probably a full decade later uh, before I even recognized how I had been harmed by that. Um, so I want to stop now before I go on to other topics and just ask people, uh, do people have questions? Do people have comments? Is anything that I'm saying resonating uh, with folks out there? Do they find any of this familiar and some of the things uh, that they experienced or that they were feeling? And I can't see, if you type a question, I can't see it, but Becky's going to help me uh, and let me know um, if there are any questions or comments uh, that anybody wants to share. Yeah, Jeff, we've had um, a couple of comments um, earlier when you were speaking about the abuse you suffered at an earlier age before scouting. 
Um, someone commented and said, early sexual abuse makes us more vulnerable to later abuse, for sure. Um, oh, that's, we had another I, comment. Go ahead. Sure. Let me, yeah, let me respond. You know, that's absolutely true. And that is um, oftentimes um, why we see repeat victimization, because this um, behavior has been normalized. Um, and if it's if, if once it was normalized with one person, it can be normalized with others. Um, and uh, so that that's absolutely true um, that uh, once someone has been um, abused, they're at increased risk for abuse later. Go on, Becky. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Um, another comment, abuse is never forgivable, and I'm talking about the abuser, the child, the boy, the teenager, he does not deserve any blame. It's the folks with power and authority over him whose actions are unforgivable. That's absolutely true, um, and I could not agree more. Um, and I think that is a constant message that we want to share with survivors. Um, and the first thing I always tell a survivor, no matter how old they were, was this wasn't your fault uh, and you didn't do anything wrong. Uh, but we know human nature uh, often leads uh, victims to a lot of self-blame. Uh, uh, and, and whether it is, uh, I, I see similar things in with survivors of child sexual abuse or adult survivors of uh, of uh, sexual assault that we recognize that that the their reaction is often an involuntary one uh, when people are faced with danger they have an involuntary reaction of fight flight or or freeze and no matter and you can't pick that. Your body sort of decides that for you. But no matter what your body decides, your brain will second guess you later. Uh, because I've talked to countless survivors, well, why did I freeze when I should have run? Or, um, you know, why did I, you know, why didn't I fight back? And so um, a lot of it is and why I think it's so important for us to talk about this is for people to be able to understand trauma and understand uh, trauma reactions, uh, to know why we do what we do, uh, because it makes it a lot less mysterious and it helps us put it in the proper context. Um, you know, the, the notion of consent is very different legally um, from what other people would think, yes, did, uh, in a practical sense, did I consent uh, to what happened to me? Maybe, but the, um, uh, from a legal standpoint, I lacked the legal capacity consent. And that's why it's never, ever uh, the victim's fault. You know, whenever I'm talking with survivors um, or anyone who feels that their life is unmanageable. I liken it to being in the middle of the field on the 50 yard line during a professional football game. Because when you're standing there on your on the field, all you know, is it's really loud, it's really scary. And there's a whole bunch of people running around. But if you saw that exact same thing from the skybox, and you could see the whole field at once, and you could see the lines in the field, um, uh, then all of a sudden you'd say, hey, I see what's happening here. And what that is, is perspective. And when we pull back and see all of the other factors that are, um, uh, that are influencing this, um, it helps us understand what's going on. And as I often tell survivors, you know, how can you win if you don't even know you're playing the game? So I think that understanding of, uh, you know, of trauma is really important. Um, you know, uh, Bob is sharing some uh, some stuff in the chat uh, that's uh, that's really important, um, and that you know, 
he waited 50 years before he Googled um, his perpetrator's name to see, you know, did anybody else come forward or what happened? Um, the And there is a real change, a real physiological change uh, that takes place when we go through a, uh, a trauma like that. Um, and uh, uh, so I think all of those experiences really uh, help shape us. And, uh, you know, people, I, I've talked to so many survivors who have waited decades before they've said anything or before they've even looked, uh, you know, made the connection between what their life is like now and what happened to them so long ago. Uh, and because it doesn't happen right away sometimes it's really difficult uh for survivors to make that connection um i tell people it's almost like being in a car accident but your leg breaks two years later and so a, a person wouldn't necessarily think oh that's related to this but we know that a lot of the injuries that are uh suffered uh, by abuse survivors are latent injuries that don't um manifest themselves until later in life sometimes not even adulthood and uh and sometimes you know whatever the problem is whether it's alcohol abuse substance abuse uh sex addiction um anxiety depression post traumatic stress dysfunctional relationships mistrust of authority migraine headaches um you know, fill in the blank. Any of those things could be a uh, response to uh, sexual abuse. And sometimes whatever it is keeps has to keep popping up uh, through a couple of different adult life cycles, disrupting someone's life before they finally say, you know, I think I need to go get help for blank, whatever it is. And uh, then they go see someone and that uh, the therapist says, well, you know, I think this might be related to the abuse you suffered as a kid. And the survivor thinks, well, I knew that I knew that stuff happened, but I never knew that this stuff happened as a result. And oftentimes it can be a real aha moment. Uh, but I think the really important thing is, is to let people know that it's never too late to make that connection. And it's never too late to think through, okay, what do we do now? That you don't have to be uh, uh, be saddled with this uh, forever. Um, uh, Becky, do we have any other comments or questions right now? Uh, we just had a couple. Um, one kind of came earlier when you were talking about um, you know dis delayed disclosure and not really realizing at the time that what happened constituted abuse. Um, a person commented and said, "I didn't even." remember my own abuse for 12 years mm. yeah that is uh and that's something that we call um dissociation uh and it's almost like a defense mechanism uh that you check out and you sort of bury those memories uh so you don't um have to deal with them um and and this is and sometimes you know, everything's a spectrum, right? Um, at the, you know, uh, dissociation, uh, where uh, those memories are actually lost, is real. It happens. Um, it's not common, but it's real. What is far more common is people know that it happened, um, but they don't talk about it, and they just sort of push it away. Uh, but there was a, um, and there's all sorts of different things that can be a prompt or trigger, uh, to bring back some of those memories. Um, I remember meeting one survivor and she had all of the hallmarks and, uh, symptoms that would lead someone to think, uh, that she had been sexually abused as a child and she'd been in therapy and she told her therapist i i do not have any memory whatsoever of this happening and then uh one day she was watching tv and the news started 
um, coming on about the uh, shooting at Virginia Tech. Uh, and she was watching this all day and she was having a really powerful reaction to it. Her, she didn't have kids at Virginia Tech. She didn't know anybody there, but it was really having an effect on her and she was crying and she woke up the next morning and she remembered and she called her therapist and uh, told him and he said, I'm not surprised. And so sometimes other traumatic reactions can sort of dislodge uh, those memories. Um, and so that is, and sometimes our, you know, our brains do that uh, to protect us. Uh, sometimes dissociation is just when we feel like, I've heard so many survivors talk about it was happening, but I wasn't there. I felt I was outside of my body watching it happen. Um, and so these are all different uh, reactions that people can have. Um, and it's not easy to uh, to reconcile that and uh, and to put that together and to sort of uh, rebuild from there. Uh, but it certainly is uh, is possible, and that's that's what the process and that healing journey is all about. Becky. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. And just one uh, one more comment, uh, which is a thank you for your work on statute of limitations. And I will echo that because. I mean, everything you've talked about so far is is precisely why, you know, work on extending or eliminating statute of limitations is so important. Yeah, it it really is, and um, and uh, so I started at the National Center for Victims of Crime in 1998. Um, it was uh, around 2000, 2001. Um, that the uh, uh, clergy abuse scandal broke in uh, Boston. Um, and it was in 2001 that uh, California opened one of the first civil windows. Uh, and for a one year period, uh, they did away with the civil statute of limitations for child sex abuse. And there were about 900 people who filed lawsuits uh, in that civil window and then the window closed and for years afterwards i would still get calls from survivors who were abused in california i'm like why didn't you bring a uh, file suit during the window or i didn't know about it or i thought that was just for uh catholic sex abuse victims like no it was for everybody um and but we saw the power that uh statute of limitations reform could have, the power to hold institutions accountable, uh, to get information, to learn what they knew and when. Um, and uh, so we knew this was a really powerful tool. And it wasn't, um, uh, uh, and then after that, uh, Hawaii had uh, opened up a civil window and they extended it and expanded it. and. Uh, because what the statute of limitations does is it really helps when you get rid of the statute of limitations, it really helps expose abusers uh, because abusers know they don't have to keep a kid quiet forever, just long enough to run out the clock. Uh, and oftentimes that was a really short clock. And um, when people uh, were ready to talk and ready to come forward, that uh, making sure that they had an opportunity to do so in the civil system uh, was really important. Uh, and then in uh, 2012, um, uh, one of the members of our National Crime Victim Bar Association, Jeff Anderson from Minnesota, uh, told me that he really wanted us to try and uh, work to uh, amend the civil statute of limitations for child sex abuse in Minnesota. Uh, and he asked me, would you please uh, help lead this effort? And so the National Center for Victims of Crime, together with some support from him, uh, we uh, made this effort uh, and we were successful in passing a bill in Minnesota that completely eliminated the civil statute of limitations moving forward and opened up a three-year window 
uh, that during those three years, no matter how long ago your abuse had occurred, even if your statute of limitations had expired in, uh, you could file suit. Um, and uh, from there, other states started to do that. Uh, we fought for a long time in New York and were finally successful in New Jersey. Uh, and then California opened up uh, another civil window. And, um, and it's really uh, provided an opportunity for justice and accountability. Um, but one of the things when all of a sudden these institutions uh, were being sued, uh, many of them sought protection in the bankruptcy courts. And uh, civil litigation is not easy. It, it is tough. It is demanding. It's not fun. It is grueling. It takes forever. Uh, I was just working with some survivors um, uh, who have been involved in litigation for five years before the case settled. Um, and then if even if you're in the middle of your lawsuit and the defendant files for bankruptcy, then everything stops. There's no more discovery. You don't get any more information. And now instead of a plaintiff, the victim is just a creditor. And they're a creditor with, you know, hundreds or thousands of other creditors. Um, and they've got to go through this bankruptcy process. And that can be really frustrating. Um, uh, We've seen numerous Catholic dioceses uh, file for bankruptcy. That doesn't mean that the victims don't get anything, but they get less. Um, and then the uh, Boy Scouts of America filed for bankruptcy. Uh, and there was a period to file uh, a notice of claim. And so if you were a survivor of scouting sex abuse, you had a limited amount of time in the bankruptcy. Uh, to file a notice of claim. And 82,000 survivors filed. Um, I was one of them. Uh, because even though uh, my statute of limitations to file a civil suit had expired, but once they filed for bankruptcy, I could file a claim. Um, and, and for those of you who are also scouting survivors, uh, who have uh, filed, you're going through the exact same bankruptcy process that I am. Um, and we know that uh, the bankruptcy judge has approved a reorganization plan, um, but that has to do with the amount of money that the Boy Scouts will pay. Uh, there's still other issues related to uh, insurance companies and what they will pay. Um, and it could still be several years before victims uh, see a, uh, a financial recovery uh, from that. But I felt that it was my, you know, I've spent 20 years advocating for victims in the civil justice system, advocating for survivors. And I felt it was my responsibility uh, to come forward and be counted and, and be a part of this process and basically practice what I preach. Becky, do we have anything else? Great, thank you, Jeff. No, not at the moment, okay. uh, but um, please feel free if, uh, if anyone has any questions or comments to, to type them in the chat. So one of the things that, um, you know, there's been a lot of news about abuse and scouting um, that's uh, uh, been percolating through the media. Certainly, the bankruptcy of the Boy Scouts has been newsworthy. Um, uh, but in the last couple years, also um, some documentaries have come out uh, that have really highlighted the, uh, the stories of survivors, what people went through, uh, what it was like. Um, and I've watched two of them. Um, Mike Johnson, who is a retired uh, police detective uh, from Plano, Texas, who was, all he did was child sex abuse cases. 
uh, he went to work for the Boy Scouts of America to be their director of youth protection and worked with them for about 10 years and said, this is what you need to do. And a lot of times they didn't want to do the things that he told them they needed to do to keep kids safe. Uh, and so ultimately he left. Um, and uh, now he's come forward and talks about the things that they knew and the things that they he told them they should do uh, that they did not do. And uh, uh, I got to know Mike, uh, and now Mike serves on the board of Zero Abuse Project. Um, and so because he's a person with information, a lot of the people um, that were looking to make these documentaries sought out Mike to talk to them. Uh, when Mike first came forward, uh, to call for a congressional investigation because the Boy Scouts is char are chartered by Congress um, about what was uh, happening and what they were doing. Um, and uh, when he first uh, came forward in a, a press conference at the National Press Club um, and that was the first time uh, that I publicly disclosed uh, my own experience uh, uh, with abuse and scouting. And so since then, some of these documentaries have come out and uh, Mike Johnson has been in them. And so I've watched some of them. Uh, one was called uh, Scout Master and then the other is uh, Scout's Honor, which just last month uh, premiered on Netflix. And uh, maybe other people have found this too, but it watching these brought up a lot of memories for me, uh, brought me back to remembering what it was like uh, that I could relate to the stories of survivors, uh, but also remembering that, um, you know, people talked about you know, they went to scouts because it was fun and they were with their friends and they liked it. And um, so it was a real mix. And it's it's um, it can be very conflicting as you think about um, how could an organization that I loved, that was a big part of my life, um, uh, that I enjoyed, that taught me great skills and uh, and uh, helped build character. Uh, was also an organization that was responsible for turning their head and turning a blind eye to the things that were happening that caused a lot of people an awful lot of, of harm. Um, and uh, I think the, uh, the simple but unsatisfying answer is that organizations are made up of people. And um, when you put people together, there are people who will do bad things. Um, but that's why we all have a responsibility uh, to be open about these things, uh, because abuse is really a crime that thrives in secrecy. Uh, and the uh, keeping secrets helps no one but the abusers. Uh, but the and and this was one of the real dynamics um, is that uh, when I was growing up and thankfully they've changed this. Uh, but when I was growing up, um, if you were gay, you could scout. You couldn't be a scout leader uh, because they just as associated uh, gays with being pedophiles. But we know uh, from the research that's not true. Most of the people who are pedophiles identify as straight men, and. Um, but because of that, um, uh, I, you know, that helped keep things quiet. Uh, that's why people were silent, uh, because people thought, oh, well, I'm, I'm going to get blamed, right? Um, I remember uh, working as staff at summer camp and the camp director, uh, you know, telling people, if you're gay, you're going home. Uh, and so even if someone was uh, being forced or coerced uh, to engage in these activities, people weren't going to say anything because they were afraid of how they would be labeled. Um, and so 
uh, it was really something that uh, exacerbated the problem uh, and made it worse. Uh, but have other people um, been watching any of these documentaries? Um, uh, has it uh, made you recognize, well, I wasn't the only one, or has it uh, helped you identify resources or people to talk about it? Or was it just too painful? Um, and did you just find uh, hearing about this uh, re-traumatizing? Anybody care to share in the chat? Well, Jeff, um, while folks are, are thinking about that, I wanted to share a couple of comments that came through while you were speaking. Oh, great. Uh, one person commented and said, my abuse was at home. It was severe. I escaped into our troop. I struggle with how to honor others with whom I associate deeply in hurt and empathize with. What is the best way to be an ally? Well, that's great. Well, and I'm sorry for um, for what you experienced. Most uh, most abuse um, happens within the home uh, because that's where people have the greatest private access to kids. Uh, I'm glad that scouting was a safe refuge for you. Um, I think that uh, the best way to uh, be an ally is to speak out and help break down the stigma. Um, the, the more we talk about it, um, the easier it is to talk about it. The easier it is for someone to come forward when they know they're not the only one. Um, when we were working on statute of limitations reform in New York, uh, we commissioned a public opinion poll. And one of the final questions was, um, are you or someone you know a survivor of childhood sexual abuse? And 50% of survey respondents said yes. Some people thought that was really high. I thought that was really low. Because if approximately 25% of people are survivors of sexual abuse, and the question was you or someone you know, then everybody knows someone who's a survivor. But they don't necessarily know that they know that person uh, because someone hasn't disclosed. Um, and so when the more we talk about it, uh, it, you know, it is not a scarlet letter. It is. Um, it is not something that's wrong with us. It's something that happened to us. Um, it's something that happened to us and to varying degrees uh, based on the individual and the circumstances, it shaped us. Um, and uh, it's a part of who we are. Uh, uh, just the same way we're shaped uh, by where we grew up and how we were raised and, uh, and things like that. Uh, but the one thing we can offer people is um, that they don't have to be silent. Uh, and uh, because the more people talk, then the more people make connections about um, the impact of that abuse and what it's done to them and what it's done to others. Uh, and so I think um, that, you know, one of the best ways to be a good ally is to one, um, always believe the victims um, and and to tell them, I'm sorry this happened to you and this wasn't your fault. Uh, there's research that shows that whenever someone does disclose, uh, how the first person they tell reacts uh, will often determine whether or not they ever tell anyone ever again. And so if someone discloses to you, uh, you might be the very first person they've told, um, react in a way that is positive and reaffirming um, and 
doesn't blame them or doesn't question them, um, doesn't ask, well, why did you wait so long? Or why didn't you tell anybody? Um, uh, because I think uh, the easier we make it for people to, to come forward, the better <coughs> we will be able uh, to sort of understand the implications. Um, and if all of the things I went through, whether it was, you know, alcohol addiction or, or uh, mental health issues or uh, trust issues, all of these trauma reactions, if we know that these arise from a number of adverse childhood experiences, of which one of them is childhood sexual abuse, um, and we know that 25% of the population, uh, you know, uh, one in four girls, one in six boys uh, were victims of abuse before the age of 18, then is it any wonder that we have all of these uh, societal problems, uh, which in many, many circumstances arise from trauma reactions? Uh, and so I think, you know, part of the, uh, the way to address that is to let people talk op openly about it and create those safe spaces where it's okay to talk. And I think that's what this survivor circle is about. Um, what survivor space is about is about creating a safe space where people can talk, where people can ask suggestion, uh, you know, ask questions um, and not be judged. And sometimes uh, when you hear from other survivors, uh, and you think, wow, that person went through what I went through, but, you know, they really look like they're doing okay. If they can do it and deal with this, then maybe I can too. Um, and, uh, and so I think that's the way that we're here uh, for each other. Um, you know, am I perfect? Absolutely not. Um, you know, as some survivors or people in recovery say, all, you know, all those different uh, trauma reactions. Yeah, I've been to that concert and I've got the T-shirt. Uh, and so a lot of us have those uh, those things that we've dealt with as a result of our trauma, um, but it, it doesn't keep us from uh, acknowledging what we went through and trying to create safe spaces for other people as well. Thank you, Jeff. We had um, a comment very much related to what you just said. Um, and then we also had um, a, an interesting question with some context around it. So I will get to that in a moment. The comment, um, you know, related to what you just said, um, secrecy is more traumatizing. For me, it is so helpful hearing other people's experience and where and how the abuse occurred. It helped me see that what happened to me wasn't normal and gave me courage to voice what happened, but also just identify what happened. That identification was life changing for me. Yeah, it really makes a huge difference when you name it. Uh, and when you, uh, and I, I think that's a big aha moment. I often say that for abuse survivors, um, you know, there are a couple of, uh, watershed moments that can take survivors right back uh, to make it feel like it's just happened. It's that real. It's that raw. And I think those things are when you name it, when you recognize that, oh my gosh, what happened to me counts as abuse, right? Um, the first time you tell someone, um, when you recognize how you've been harmed by it, right? Um, that, oh, all of these things I've been dealing with, are a result of that. And that sort of makes you angry about it all over again. Um, but at least you know, oh, that's why that happened. And then then you it gives you some understanding that, yes, it is, it, it's absolutely not your fault. And there's research that shows that the um, one of the factors in the harmful impact of abuse has to do with how long the secret is held. That the longer people keep the secret and don't disclose, the more damaging it is. It's almost like a pinball machine and that uh, instead of a pinball bouncing around inside you, 
it's a wrecking ball of trauma that's wreaking havoc with your life um, because it's it doesn't have any place else to go. Um, and uh, so that's why we all often want to make sure people understand that when we look at the um, as we sort of measure the impact of the abuse, some of the harm is caused by how long the secret is held. So thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, and Becky, what was the other one that you wanted to uh, pass along? Yeah, so we had a question um, kind of with a, a story around it. Um, so the, the comment is, I, I heard a survivor from Michigan years ago that is also working as a prosecutor. He speaks on his victimization as a child and said that when a detective spoke with him during the investigation, the detective immediately told him that the sexual assaults were not his fault. He explained that it never occurred to him as a child that anyone would think that it was his fault. Because of that, he went on to explain that he does not recommend we tell survivors that it's not their fault. I write prevention and response documentation. I really want to keep including telling children this is not their fault. Likewise, I want to re reinforce this with the parents. Is there a way we can do this? Some language we can say to lead into the phrase of this is not your fault. That's a great question. Um, and I think, um, you know, I think, I don't think telling someone that it's, it's not their fault um, plants the idea that someone would think it was, but I think, um, and I think it, it, and I think sometimes it's different. Um, it might be different for a child uh, than for an adult survivor of childhood sexual abuse, uh, because the longer someone has spent in their head, and adults can be full of self blame. But I think that's a great, I think that's a great suggestion. How do we lead up to that, um, and in a way that doesn't, uh, that doesn't do that? Um, uh, and Becky, I think that's something that we should, you know, round table with survivor space, um, you know, whether it's, and I don't know that this is, and I'm also going to talk with our forensic interviewers, um, who are experts in this or, and especially about talking with kids about what's the right way to, uh, uh, to broach that. And I think. I think it also has to do with the circumstances of the abuse because um, if someone, you know, grabs a kid and drags them somewhere or forces them to do something, then yeah, no one's going to think that's their fault. But we know that so much abuse is perpetrated by grooming uh, where it is, uh, uh, abusers will slowly and um, incrementally over time violate boundaries, like people to make victims think this was their idea or this is just having fun. And so I think it's the times when, um, uh, when it is really forced that, of course, why would anyone think that it was my fault, but it's when it is coerced and there's grooming and uh, survivors are lured into it that there's a much uh, uh, greater chance that whether at that time or um, uh, later in adulthood that people will look at that and say, um, you know, nobody put a gun to my head. Um, you know, I guess, uh, you know, maybe I should have done something different. Is this is this my fault? Um, so I think that's a great question and I'm going to turn to our experts and hopefully we can post something on survivor space about that. Yeah, that's a great suggestion, Jeff. And I will also offer years ago, I had, um, a, a teenage girl who knew that I worked with survivors who, um, uh, approached me about a relationship that she was having with an adult coach. And it had just been brought to her attention by caring adults in her life that the relationship was abusive. And she didn't feel that way. 
And, you know, I remember one of the things I told her was that it's okay that she didn't feel like it was abusive. And, you know, as the conversation went on, you know, we talked about how she was being manipulated by him and, and that, and it led to the fact that, you know, what he, he did as part of that relationship with her was not her fault. Mm -hmm. But in the beginning, you know, she didn't feel like anything was wrong at all. So I kind of just went with that, the way she was feeling and kind of validated that at the beginning before kind of diving into this is not your fault. He is terrible. What he did was horrible, you know. Um, but yes, to your point, um, I think to, to have our our survivors and, and subject matter experts with uh, survivor space weigh in on this is uh, an excellent idea. I also um, put my email address in the chat if anybody would want um, some specific uh, feedback or um, resources or answers to specific questions, please feel free to um, to email me. Um, and okay, that person provided their contact information. Perfect. Um, and I know we're like a minute over time, but if you have an extra minute, Jeff, um, one additional question. Sure. Do you know of any other educational programs or organizations that talk about abuse specifically with a focus on prevention and education? Um, uh, certainly, um, uh, at Zero Abuse Project, our Jacob Wetterling Resource Center focuses a lot on uh, prevention. We've got a prevention education curriculum uh, that's taught in schools. Um, the uh, Zero Abuse is a member of the Prevention Coalition. Uh, next week, I'm going to be in um, uh, Atlanta uh, for our uh, uh, prevention coalition meeting. Um, there is a, if you go to um, uh, keepkidssafe.org, uh, there's a lot of organizations that have come together uh, that have, and there is a blueprint uh, for preventing sexual violence against kids. Um, and there, there's, there can't be too many people doing this work. Um, I believe that, uh, you know, that's why at Zero Abuse, our focuses are prevention, response, education, and training. Uh, we certainly want to prevent abuse from happening, uh, but when it hasn't been prevented, we've got to respond to it. Uh, and some of the response is to keep, uh, you know, has a prevention uh, implement uh, uh, as well, because when we identify and prosecute an abuser, we can prevent them from har harming other kids. Um, and But a lot of times it's just, we need to increase education so people understand this. People don't wanna talk about it. Um, even parents are really uncomfortable talking to their kids about stuff. And, uh, and we really have to uh, make these things something that you can talk about at the dinner table uh, in order to sort of break down that taboo. Um, and that's something I tried to do with my kids. Um, uh, and I was always happy for them to talk about anything at the dinner table. Um, you know, sometimes I'd be a little chagrined when they'd wait till their grandmother was there to bring it up. And I'm like, okay, we have to do this in front of my mom. But, uh, but it was more important that they knew that they could talk about anything uh, at any time uh, to go to an adult that they trust uh, for real information. And, uh, you know, we all have a role to play in keeping kids safe and uh, and uh, Zero Abuse is really uh, pleased to be part of the group that's asking people, do you know what you can do and what's your role uh, so that we can all work on this together? Um, everybody, thank you so much uh, for your time, uh, for being here. Uh, I greatly appreciate you, and um, uh, hopefully we'll be able to talk again. Yes, thank you, every everyone, for joining today. Uh, we will leave the chat up for um, a few minutes after we're done here. So if anyone has any additional questions uh, that you'd like to ask or comments, um, we'll be sure to get those over to, to Jeff. But thank you so much, Jeff. Um, what a wonderful presentation. I always enjoy hearing you speak, and I know uh, the folks tuning in today um, greatly appreciate it as well. So thank you everyone for joining us and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much.